you're visiting tonight, we welcome you. Make yourself right at home. It's good to be here. If you're born again, you may not know a soul in this auditorium, but if you're born again, you're my brother or sister. My Amen. 1922. year was 1922. 1919, the Treaty of Versailles ended the Great War right. to end all wars. Yeah. No more war. No. no more war. And you and I both know the history. But in 1922, archaeologist named Howard Carter in Egypt for years had been looking for the tomb of Tutankhamun. In the early 1800s, Jean-Paul Champollion, who was uh, uh, one thing a linguist with Napoleon, and they had occupied Egypt. And in Rosetta, Egypt, they found a stone it's called the Rosetta Stone. I think it's in the British Museum. The Rosetta Stone had uh, three, four columns and Greek and so forth, and, but it also had uh, hieroglyphics. And Champollion was a very smart man. He was able to decipher and establish what hieroglyphics said. You could read them now. You could read all those hieroglyphics on the tombs and all the places in Egypt. Thus, Egyptology was born. And you know what it is today. It's a huge thing. But in any event, one king mentioned was Tutankhamun. And they'd never, they couldn't find his tomb in a place called the Valley of the Kings. But they did eventually. Howard Carter was financed by uh, Lord of Carnarvon, the fifth Lord of Carnarvon. He was financed by him. And Carnarvon told him, said, I'm about to run out of money. He said, I'm not going to finance you anymore. You haven't found the tomb, so this is it. He begged for one more year, one more season. He said, all right, you've got one more season. He went back to work, and his time was about to run out. He still hadn't found it. He literally had come down to the last section, the last few days, weeks of whatever time he had. And then he found a step. And this step had been covered because, I guess, because of a huge flood or something that had happened uh, millennia ago. And he began to dig into that step. And it took him a few days to get deeper and deeper. And lo and behold, he found the tomb of Tut, Tutankhamun. When he found that tomb, that tomb dates back to about 1,300 B.C., which would make it 3,300 years old. In plain words, he was close contemporary of Moses. It's quite remarkable when you think about this. Akhenaten, Akhenaten was the father of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Tut. And he had uh, changed the religion of Egypt completely. And he worshipped the sun. I believe there's only one god, the sun god. So they worshipped. He worshipped the sun. But when he died, his son took over and restored the ancient Egyptian religion. And uh, if you read much about Egyptology, you'll know that they went in there and they tried to deface everything that Akhenaten had done because he was considered a heretic in the land. But to get back to the story, they eventually got through the walls and the gates and the doors into the tomb. And when they got there, they were literally blown away with what they saw. Gold everywhere. Handmade uh, chariots and the wheels all kinds of stuff. But the main thing about it is that it was 3,300 years old. And then they found the mummy of Tut. And his face was covered with a golden shroud. One of the most beautiful things ever been made by the hand of man. To this very day, I'm sure all of you have seen it. You might not have known what you're looking at, but you've seen it. To this very day is one of the most uh, recognizable things on earth is that shroud of King Tut. But of course he had died millennia ago, but they found it, they discovered it. Over 5,000 pieces and uh, it took them a long time to gather all of that out. And of course he was a British Englishman, so this is one of the reasons why the British Museum was probably the finest museum in the world because of the fact that Britain was an empire and everywhere they went, they carried stuff back to England. 
But something began to happen. The man who financed it, Carnarvon, died not too long after that. And then they began to die. And it depends on who you're reading, but the number is by some is eight, nine, and some even more. And then other strange coincidences. For example, when Carnarvon died, they say that the lights in Egypt went out that night. All of Egypt, the lights went out, or at least in Cairo. And so what happened is that you, the press dubbed it the mummy's curse. The mummy's curse. And the mummy's curse, of course, has uh, produced some movies today, the mummies and so forth. They like it. They're making a lot of money off a mummy. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, but the point is that the curse... Uh, to some is a very real thing. Here's what was written inside that tomb, they say. Death will come on swift pinions to those who disturb the rest of the Pharaoh. Boy, what about that? Do you believe that Satan has the power to kill someone? Oh, yeah. 1 Corinthians 5 turns such an one over the devil. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 19, this is what's important about this. And that is people don't realize that they're not, they're not dealing with things. They're dealing with spirits. Right. Spirits. And Egypt is a hotbed of spirituality. Always has been is to this day. Here's what the apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 19. What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, now we're talking about Egyptians or any other, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. Now watch the wording carefully. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. That word fellowship with devils that word is koinonia, folks. That's the same word you find in 1 John chapter number 1 when we have our fellowship with the Father and with His Son. We have something in, something in common. We communicate with each other. So if you want to take it by face value for what it says, you can communicate with a devil. And that devil can communicate back to you. And you can be careful that you don't awaken and unleash spiritual forces that you don't know what you're fooling with. And this is what's happening now in America. The gates of hell have been opened. Right. Revelation right. chapter number 9, he said, I saw an angel with the key of the bottomless pit. Yeah. All right. Now yeah. that pit in Revelation 9 is in tribulation. But he that letteth will let to be taken out of the way. Amen. I think that's a gradual movement right now. I want you to think of the wealth of the Egyptians, though. Wealth, untold wealth compared to the poverty of the Jews. They had been there for 400 years. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, it said, And he said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward they shall they come out with great substance. Then he names all of the pagans and so forth. And he talks about the land. He said in verse 18, And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile River, yeah. unto the great river, that's the Euphrates, one of the four mentioned in the book of Genesis. Yeah. It's called a Hittikel in Genesis. Yeah. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, the Hittites, Perizzites, and Rephaims. The Rephaims connected directly with giants. And the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gergesites and the Jebusites and so forth and so on. The Jebusites were the ones that occupied Jerusalem. It was David that drove the Jebusites out of Jerusalem. And once he had driven them out of there, Jerusalem became the capital of Israel. Jerusalem. In Hebrew, it is Jerusalem. It is the city of peace. So we have here a picture of people that had been 400 years in a foreign land. God sends them a deliverer. And look what he says to him in the book of uh, Exodus, chapter number 20, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Here's what he says, to, he says uh, to Moses. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, 
Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. The problem is you'll search in vain to find him saying that to Pharaoh. He didn't say it like he should have. He should have told him. The firstborn is the one who opens the womb. The firstborn is the beginning of strength. The firstborn is the one that is endowed with a greater posterity than the rest of them in inheritance and power, spiritual authority. And so the Lord said, Israel is my son. So now here the Lord telling you that Israel, the Old Testament, time of Egypt, 1400 B.C., is his son, his firstborn. Now if you'll notice in Matthew chapter number 2 and verse number 13, Here's a remarkable prophecy. Matthew chapter number 2 and verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there till I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child, his mother, by night, and departed to Egypt, and was there till the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled. Now watch this which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Yeah. Now, if you'll go back to the book, of, uh, the book of Jeremiah, you'll see what he's quoting, because he quotes Jeremiah. Yeah. And Jeremiah talks about uh, how that he was, uh, no, it isn't, it's Jeremiah, it's Hosea. In Hosea chapter number 11, here's what it says. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now notice that Matthew quotes that scripture and applies it to the Lord Jesus Christ who is brought up out of Egypt. And yet when Hosea prophesies, he makes an application directly to Israel, to the people. This is as clear a case in the Bible where you have a double application of the same scripture. And it's, listen, that's a gold mine in trying to understand the Bible. Yeah. It's a double application. The prophecy is, is applied two times before it is filled full, and it may yet be another one. And I'll show you when we get toward the end of the message tonight. He called them out of Egypt. Yeah. Now, when he called Israel out of Egypt, Jeremiah was prophesying. He called them out of Egypt. Uh, he called them out of Egypt because he wanted them to, uh, to serve the Lord. He called them away from uh, captivity, uh, away from uh, apostasy. And so we read over here in Matthew chapter number 2, in Hebrews 11 rather, Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 23, first he said, out of Egypt have I called my son. And if you'll notice in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had rec respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt." not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. You see, that's me. Hebrews chapter number 11 is a picture of believers. And so Moses chose to reject Egypt to turn against it. And that's a choice, a conscious decision that you make today. You choose to reject Egypt and its gods, its morality, its lifestyle, its culture. You reject it outright, outright, because that's not who you are. Now, first he said, Israel is my son, and he called his son out of Egypt and made a double application of the scripture. And then we have in Hebrews chapter number 11 a picture of how Moses chose 
to be identified with the people of God. And so therefore, as Moses made a choice, I've made a choice. Therefore, I am a son of God yes. by the new yes. birth. Yes. And I have made a choice yes. to leave Egypt. I hope you have. Yes. I hope you have. Some of you probably, God bless your soul, have, you have to have one more night with the frogs. Yeah. One more night with the frogs. Right. Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh wasn't ready. He had to spend another night with the frogs. Now, I want you to see in Matthew chapter number seven, two rather, in verse 17, here's an example from Scripture to show you how the Bible is such a remarkable book. Matthew chapter number two and verse number 17. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah, was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Well, now, Rachel, folks, in, in Jeremiah, when this is prophesied, chapter number 31, had been dead for centuries. So what he does, he takes somebody that had passed away a long time ago and has them speaking from the grave. What's the context of Matthew chapter number 2? Rachel weeping for her children. Is it not Herod having all the children two years old and under put to death? You see how the writer of Matthew reaches back into Jeremiah, and we'll read Jeremiah in just a moment, takes that scripture and applies it to the murderous Herod that had killed those little children. Here's what the scripture says in Jeremiah 31, verse 15, if you'd like to turn there with me. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. When Jeremiah prophesies here about Rachel, he is not prophesying about Rachel having a bunch of children. How many Ra children did Rachel have? Yes, she had two children, which were very prominent, right? Yes, who were her two children? Absolutely, absolutely. Joseph, and if it hadn't been for Joseph, Israel would have starved to death, you see. But she didn't lose either one of them. She didn't lose her two children, yet she is used as a pitcher of a mother that is losing her children, crying out from the grave. In other words, Jeremiah reaches back and takes Rachel, a matriarch. One of the, the Jews called her, not her, but Leah, they called him the one that built the house of Israel because she had so many children. He reaches back there and he gives her a voice and says she's crying. And then in Matthew, Matthew quotes that very thing from Jeremiah and says, here's a woman that's been dead for centuries, yet she is quote, she's crying out from the grave as to what you have done, uh, Herod, in killing all these children. Now, when Israel was delivered from Egyptian captivity, how were they delivered? They were delivered by a lamb and by a blood covenant. Okay, not just a lamb, folks. Don't, don't ever get stuck, stuck on that but the blood covenant of the lamb. You see, it's the blood. So a blood covenant God established with his people now when he gets them out of Egypt. He delivers them from Egypt. Watch how this thing progresses. In the book of Exodus chapter number 15, when Moses, the Bible says, saw Pharaoh and his army swallowed up in the Red Sea. The Red Sea's an ocean. It's an ocean. If your preacher's preaching about the Sea of Reeds uh, four inches or five inches deep, get you another preacher. Amen. Amen. Because he has no more scriptural authority than I could rise and fly. He has no scriptural authority for that. Amen. None. So the, we, have a, we have an ocean. We have, a, we have an ocean before these people. And God, of course, you know the story. He opens the ocean and he sends the east wind and it, and, it, and it dries the ground and the children of Israel go across on dry ground and into that Pharaoh with his army goes. Why? Because his heart's hardened. Any man with half sense would have stood there on that bank and said, hold on a minute. 
We're dealing with a God that can open up the waters. That means that God can close those waters, and he ain't my God. <laughs> I better leave him alone. But he didn't because his heart was hardened. A hard heart will charge into the darkness. He'll charge into the darkness. He'll charge into ignorance. He'll charge into superstition. He'll charge into places that he doesn't understand. But that's what a hard heart will do. When God saved you, he gave you wisdom. We're children of the light, not of the night. Amen. We follow the light, not the darkness. Amen. But notice carefully, Moses sang a song. They stood on the bank of the Red Sea, and Moses leads them in a song. Amen. It's not remarkable. For your own edification, you ought to do just a little short survey of the Old Testament times it mentions singing. You'd be amazed. Yeah. We got 150 songs Psalms, that's what they mean. In other words, the Jews were singing people. They were singing all the time. Singing. And I think that's remarkable because Moses writes a song and he said to the children of Israel, this song to the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He's my God, and I'll prepare him as an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is the man of war. Jehovah is his name. Amen. 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 So if this unbelieving world out here wonders why we sing all the time, that's why. Yes. Because we've been saved. Amen. And we got the same spirit in us that Moses had in him. No question about it whatsoever. Songs. And I'm going to tell you something, too, about the songs. They number in the tens of thousands. Probably hundreds of thousands. <coughs> songs written about one man, one man, and is Christ Jesus the Lord. If you ever, if you ever meet him, you'll sing about him. <laughs> Why? Because he's wonderful. <laughs> He's worthy to be sung about in every sense of the word. The Lord Jesus Christ is. Uh, he says in the verse number seven of his song, In greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sendest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. So we have a situation here now where the Lord has delivered Israel from Egypt. He's delivered them. He's delivered them from Egypt because they're his sons and firstborn. And Moses sings a song, and it's a beautiful song because it's a song of victory. And we've already won the victory, folks. Let me say, let me say that again. He won the victory, and I benefit from him. When he, when he needs to be, he's a man of war. When he needs to be, he's a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Whatever the case calls for, he's able to fulfill the need of it absolutely. Now, I want you to look at Hosea chapter number 2 and verse 14. Now, we're getting into prophecy tonight. Hosea chapter number 2 and verse number 14. Now, we know how Hosea starts, don't we? It starts with Gomer, it starts with a slave auction. It starts with one who had thrown her life away and thrown away everything that was good, and she wound up being sold, sold on the marketplace. God said, Hosea, go buy her. And so he went and bought her. And of course, she is a type of Israel. It says plainly in the book of uh, Hosea, this Gomer is a type of Israel. And so these types, as I've been trying to talk about here in the last few weeks, they're very important because they show us some beautiful pictures. In Hosea chapter 2 and verse number 14, Therefore, behold, I will allure her. Okay? I'm going to draw her and bring her into the wilderness, into the wilderness, and speak comfortably unto her. I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. Achor is where... where uh, uh, they were, his, his whole family was stoned to death. Yeah, Achan. Achan and his family, his wife, his children. But he said, I'm going to take a place like that and I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to take the bad and make it good. God can do that. 
She shall sing there as in the days of her youth. See the singing? As in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Here we go. Now we, 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 Egypt is mentioned again. And the Lord said, I call my son out of Egypt. Now look at verse 16, Hosea 2. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, thou shalt, that thou shalt call me Ishi. That's Hebrew for husband. And shall, shalt call me no more Bailey or Baal, which is a pagan god. For I will take away the names of Baal or Baalim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. In that day will I make a covenant for them with the beast of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the earth. And so forth he goes on. But keep in your mind the first two verses I read. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. Now turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 and verse 1. Revelation 12, 1. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Who is this? Joseph told you who it was. Jacob said, shall I, referring to the woman that he dreamed about, in plain words, the woman is not the church, folks. The woman is Israel. And he said, a woman, Israel, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And upon her head a crown of 12 stars. See that? 12 tribes of Israel. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's what Herod tried to do, remember? Yeah. Herod, the child fled to Egypt and then came back up out of Egypt. Well, now here we have this great red dragon. He's going to devour the child as soon as it is born. So what child would be born of Israel that's so important to the dragon? Yeah. Yeah. Son of God. The Son, yeah. Son of God. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Oh, yeah. You ever read that? There couldn't be, shouldn't be any doubt in your mind now. We're talking about the Lord Jesus. Rod the nation with a, with a rod of iron. And... Uh, her child was caught up into God and to his throne. He was ascended, didn't he? Yeah. he ascended into the presence of the Father. Right. But let's go on. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there two, or there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Another way of saying that is a three and one half years. You remember the Old Testament where I read that he will bring her into the wilderness, book of Hosea? He's going to bring her into the wilderness. Now watch this. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. He takes a personal hand in protecting her that they should feed her, her, her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was war in heaven. Right. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought his angels. Who does Michael stand for? <laughs> Let's say in the book of Daniel chapter 12. He stands for Israel. Yes, Michael. So if Michael's involved in it, Israel is involved in it. Right. And we're fighting over Israel. Her existence, her being, and her salvation. And so Michael fights with a dragon. If you read about Michael early in the Bible, it said when contending with the body of Moses, he said, the Lord, the Lord rebuke thee, Satan, by the name and power of God. Here Michael confronts Satan face on. We have an archangel and an anointed cherub. They're locking horns here in chapter 12 of Revelation. 
And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I had heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren. He is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. This is Israel, folks. This is not the church. There's no question about it. So what's going on? Satan has cast down to the earth. For three and one half years, Israel, Israel is going to be persecuted like it has never been persecuted before in its life. A brother mentioned a moment ago as we came through the foyer, he said, in three days it'll be Tishbiav. How many of you know what Tishbiav is to the Jew? The, the temple was killed in 70 AD, it was destroyed, Tishbiav. You go back to Jewish history and you'll find out that time and time and time and time again, something horrible has happened to Israel, Israel on Tishbiav. Remember, that's the ancient people. We're babies in diapers in our country. We're, we haven't been here any time. These are the ancient people. They've been here thousands of years. Tishbiav, Tishbiav, up in three days. You know that the, that the Speaker of the House of Representatives went to Taiwan, came off the jet and stood there, and I'm all for her. I support her 1,000% in what she did because we have no, you have no idea what China is going to do. Right. If, she's, if China is not confronted... If she's not confronted, then my friend, all you're going to do is open the door for her to do more. Right. You have to, it takes force. It takes right. strength. The only thing a despot understands is strength. They don't know anything about diplomacy. They don't know anything about morality. No. It's all about brute strength. Right. That's why the ruler of North Korea shut his mouth when Trump told him, he said, we got bigger guns than you. And he said, we could unloose on you a hell on this earth that had never been seen before by man. Do you know what their leader of North Korea did? He shut up and backed off. Why? Because he's bluffing. He's not a world power. But we're looking at China, okay? We're looking at China. Is God going to deliver his people? Is he going to bring them up out of Egypt? Look at Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation chapter number 11, and we're talking about the two witnesses of Revelation 11, and I personally believe they're Moses and Elijah, a lot of folks, Enoch and somebody, but, uh, you know, that's, that's entirely up to what, the way you see the scripture. I see it as Moses and Elijah. Verse 8, their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city. Now watch this, which spiritually is called Sodom and what? Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So now he's going to redeem them and bring them out of Egypt again. And this will be the last time they'll never, ever be brought under the power of Egypt again. Now, folks, all you've got to do is look at some of these ancient Egyptian uh, art and some of their, some of their, their, their metal work with, with gold and all you'll find a highly advanced civilization. Yeah. Highly advanced. Highly advanced. Yet in some areas they were so ignorant. They were so ignorant because they knew nothing of the hereafter. They didn't have the light. They didn't have the truth. So they had all these gods. So what's happened here? Spiritually, it is Sodom and Egypt. In plain words, the Jew, the Jew, that has the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel has the true God. Yes, he does. He's never changed. But the Jews today fit into all kinds of different categories. A lot of Jews follow the Kabbalah or Kabbalah. And Kabbalah or Kabbalah in Jewish, 
in the Jewish religion is nothing in the world more than pagan mysticism in its Jewish form with its tree of life and all the rest of it that goes with it. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel wrote the Bible. If you want the truth, you'll get the truth. God is a good God. The Bible said the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. That's the Bible. Oh boy. I'm going to give an account to him. I'm going to face him one day. And you know something, folks, I don't get excited and shout about that either. I know some folks say, well, glory to God, it's going to be a wonderful thing. Now, when he gets done with you, <laughs> we all appear to the judgment seat of Christ, and it's not my place to judge you. We'll leave that up to the judge. <laughs> but I know within myself, I haven't always done exactly what he wanted me to do. I haven't always been where I should have been. I failed him. He's never failed me, but I failed him, glory to God. And so I have to give an account. That's why I'm trying to finish up the race. I'm 75 years old. I fought a good fight, finished my course, kept the faith. That's what Paul said. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Timothy preached the word. Not how much time I have left. I hope I'm here when the Lord comes back. Yeah. I used to run track. I ran the 400. Four, they called it, well, they called it 440 back then. It's, it's one pass around a football field. I ran that and I ran the high hurdles. I never did run the relay because it wasn't fast enough. But the relay puts the fastest man last. And it's, uh, he takes the baton from the one in front and the, he goes to finish the race. He finishes his course. Well, by the grace of God, until I drop dead in my tracks, I'm going to do that. I'm going to finish the course. Amen. I'm going to finish it. Glory to God, I am. I'm going to finish what I'm here for. You better believe it. It makes no difference what dog fight I get into. It doesn't make any difference what enemies thrown against me. I, am no, I'm, I have no power over anyone, but I know who's in me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I am going to finish my course by the grace of God. And my prayer to the Lord has been time and time and time and time again, God, when you get done with me, don't let me languish out here in some place. I'm not interested in going to some retirement home somewhere. If you want to, that's fine. I'm not putting anybody down. Not me. When he's done with me, I want to leave. I want to go. I want to go. I want to leave here because I know where my home is. I'm a pilgrim and a stranger. Indeed. And the more I see of this godless culture of this country, the more I know that I am not a citizen of this world. Amen. No, sir, my heart is not here. My heart is somewhere else. So the Bible says that the devil is cast down. He knows he hath but a short time. And Israel now is going to be brought out of Egypt, spiritual Egypt. Egypt. Where is that? Where, both, where our Lord was crucified. What city is that? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So when the Lord comes to lure them and call them out to him in the wilderness, he's going to call them out of Jerusalem and the, and the areas around there. And he's going to call them into the field. And the Bible said he's going to make them pass under the rod and he's going to purge out the rebels. And then he's going to present to himself and he's going to talk to them and he's going to tell them what he intend, intends to do. And that he's going to leave. And he's going to come back and get them. But they don't know exactly when. This is why you have that parable over there in Matthew where it says you have this, 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 this wicked servant. Uh, it says, well, the Lord delayeth his coming. This is Israel. This is Jewish. It's all Jewish. There's no church there. And so they're... That some of them are waiting, but some of them are not waiting for the coming of the Lord. See, it's such a, you get in such trouble when you try to ram the church anywhere in the book of Revelation after chapter 5. Huh. 
He said, come up hither. From chapter number 5 all the way to chapter 19, it has nothing to do with the church. But then in chapter 19, when I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses. That's me. I'm not a big, I don't have a lot of experience riding horses. Believe me, I'm a fast learner. <laughs> this one you want me to ride, Lord? We got him. <laughs> no problem. Now you understand, you're above the clouds and you're going down. <laughs> That's all right. Don't sweat it. I'm going to ride that horse. So I don't believe any horses in heaven. You don't. When Moses cast his rod to the ground, what did it become? It became a serpent. Out of the, you're talking about the creator, folks. Good night. Wake up. Man, don't be so childish. He can create anything he pleases in a moment of time. But anyway, anyway, they're going to come and they're going to take them. And when they do, he's going to take them out of Egypt again. Three times he's delivered his firstborn, his son, out of Egypt. Sodom and Egypt. Isn't it amazing how it just says, it doesn't just say Egypt, it says Sodom and Egypt. Yeah. You ever notice that? Yeah. It's amazing how accurate the Bible is. Yes. Today they call evil good and good evil. Yeah, yeah they do. They're, they're, they're trying to brainwash you. They're trying, they're trying because of... They're trying their dead level best to change the meaning of all the words, gender identity, and all this other stuff and just turn it upside down. Yeah. Well, it won't work. No. It won't work if you know who you are and where you came from. Yeah. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you for the house that we can meet in, time we have. But my life is in your hands, Lord. Yeah. I've told you that a thousand times. My life is in your hands. And I pray that you'd use me as long as I'm in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.